Hi, everybody. Uh, I've got a great session to start off today. And for, for a bit of context, uh, Chris Grant uh, spoke with us previously uh, while he was at, at King Games, and we've invited him back here because uh, we felt his story was very interesting from the perspective of designers and and. and people within any team and, and, and growth and, and what redesigning means for, for on a personal basis, on a, a team basis and at a company level as well. Uh, Chris, how are you doing? Good. How are you, Catherine? I'm great. This I'm is exciting. Forward... Eh? This is a lot of pressure to kick off this day, like just <laughs> you and I talking. I hope we live up to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm not going to do much talking. I'm actually going to let you do the talking because you're the person who's got something interesting to say. Um, but no, I'm excited because we, we've had a good conversation and, and uh, what you have to share is really great. Um, but before you've started a new role at Preply, and uh, I want to talk about that, but let's get stuck. There you go. Let's get stuck into before that. Let's get stuck into King Games. Um, you've worked there for quite a long time for, for six years and you've seen a number of um, growth um, periods, uh, Candy Crush and everything. Um, could you tell us about what was your biggest lesson from your time there? That's a great question. Well, first off, uh, thank you for not asking me how you can get extra lives, uh, how you can get free gold bars. That tends to be what people ask me when they find out that I worked at, at Candy Crush. By the way, uh, to all my fellow King alumni, people still at King, I still play Candy Crush every day. I'm on level 1733 now. Uh, so that's a testament to a good product if I ever did see one. Um, biggest lesson, uh, it, was, it was quite an interesting time uh, uh, over the six years. And I, I shared a little bit of what I, I learned last year at UXDX. Um, check the archives if you want to see what it was like to try to build research up from scratch. Um, a different kind of like player testing model. Um, I'd have to say the biggest idea for me was that um, was... <laughs> There's this song, they say, the hardest to learn was the least complicated. So I went in thinking I knew what games were, were. I thought I knew what gamification was. And I thought I knew the role that games played and, and how hard it was to make games. And over six years, what I learned was I didn't know very much uh, when I walked in the door. By the time I left, I discovered a couple really important things, I think. One, uh, entertainment products play a very, very important role in people's lives. And um, we we... We, we ignore the lessons that we can learn from those entertainment products uh, and from the importance that they play at our peril. I think all of us, probably most of the people out there watching right now, aren't working in games. We're working on what we would affectionately call a king task-based design, right? Like I have to do something. I have to send money over uh, to, from my bank account. I have to, uh, I have to you know, drive somewhere, uh, like Ma Michaela was talking about with Volkswagen. Um, you have a tendency maybe to think games like, oh, that's just something like people do for fun. Fun's a pretty important thing. And we all learned that a lot over the last couple of years, right? Like without, without certain, <laughs> a certain distraction, without a certain amount of fun, life can be, life can be pretty hard. When speakeasies are happening through Zoom, as opposed to the, the previous 20s when they were happening in a bar somewhere behind a closed door, we need digital things to keep us going. So first thing is uh, games, really, really important in people's lives. And the second thing is we all tend to think about games and gamification, I think, uh, the wrong way. We think about it as like, oh, I can just copy like specific features from from there. Like I've seen a lot, uh, especially in the language world, you see, oh, let's do streaks or let's do let's do counters. And honestly, like gamification is, is a lot more profound. Uh, it's a lot simpler, the definition, but it's a lot harder to achieve. When it comes to gamification, what it really is, is how do you make somebody enjoy something that they're doing and that they're doing over and over again without the pleasure of the payoff in the real world. A minute ago, I talked about task-based uh, apps and services and products. Well, when you have to send money somewhere, the pleasure comes when you send the money. When you have to drive somewhere, the pleasure comes when you arrive at your destination. Games don't have that. All that games really have is the game itself. And so there's a, there's a power and, and, and a beauty in it deep creativity in what the folks at games do at King or any other game, especially casual games, that they can create something that can give you the payoff in that world itself. And it's one of the things that I look most forward to exploring now that I've moved out of games for a while and I'm in, in ed tech. How can we take that, that idea of like, of giving that payoff, uh, of, of going with that really big emotional, emotional payoff um, from the world of games and apply it outside of games without just, you know, doing the, the cheap thing of copying, right? And having dashboards and streaks and stuff like that. 
Yeah, and I think it comes down to also yeah, doing what you love. Um, an article popped up recently on Elon Musk's famous 120 hours uh, a week. But the key piece there is that it doesn't feel like that because if you're if you're doing something you love, it, it's not work and time and perception is, is very different. Um, okay, so could you explain for the audience a little bit more about what we discussed on this topic of re, what, what redefining what design means for you? Um, could you could you explain more on that? Sure. Um, I started as a web designer uh, so long ago. Honestly, I'm not going to say it on a on a call in front of hundreds of people. It's embarrassing, but let's say uh, it was pre dot com boom of the 2000s. So like it was a, it was a long time ago. Didn't know it. And uh, uh, yeah, exactly. I know. Um, and uh, and I I personally have been on a journey that I think in a lot of ways reflects the journey that design has been on. Um, and we've all seen it started with you know started famously once upon a time with. Uh, Don Norman is the first experience UX user experience mm-hmm. designer, and slowly but surely, what we've seen is, is as these digital products have become a bigger part of our life, is that people have started to figure out that design isn't just window dressing. It isn't just that thing that you you know. It's just not. It's not just putting the screens together, right? It's actually fitting all the pieces together. We like to use the quote a lot in, in at Preply. You know, you can design things the right way, but first you got to make sure you're designing the right thing. And, and to me, that's, that's still, you know, we're, what's 2021 now? Uh, it's been a while. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, and yet I still feel people defaulting back to, the, to seeing design as this tactical arm. And there's a cool thing when you start to see design as, as asking bigger questions. It's that actually the answering of those questions, design, might, design and, and research when you partner them together, might be able to ask the big questions, but it comes up. It comes down to everybody in the organization, everybody in the company answering those big questions, right? You and I, when we talked, when we were were prepping for this, I mentioned that like, I I always get the question and whether it's in my classes or in things like this, like what is user experience and what is a good user experience? And I default to a quote I read a long time ago that a good user experience is useful. It does something that I need to be done. I, I can I find it useful. It's usable. I'm able to use this thing, and and I'm able to use it from the beginning. But as I use it more and more, I get better at it, and then it's desirable. It makes me feel good doing that. So asking that it starts with something very very basic, which is: Do people actually want this product? That's not that doesn't have a lot to do with you know that very first thing doesn't have a lot to do with how it looks. Or, or how it feels. It's more about what it actually does. And so in a lot of ways, I feel like that's the goal right now for design to redefine itself. It's to redefine itself as the group, as the group when partnered with research that asks those questions. And then it's to set everybody's brain in the organization on the task of trying to, of trying to answer those questions together. Yeah, and, that, and that's a that's a tall ask uh, to, to get all of the organization aligned to, to do that. And and so in consideration of that, why why Preply? There's such big shoes to fill in terms of your expectations. Why why did you join Preply? I uh, I have a very well. First off, from a really personal standpoint, like I have a, a real soft spot when it comes to ed tech. So. Uh, God, the years are starting to add up. So 10 years ago, I worked in a startup. Um, we were way ahead of our time. It was called Sclipo. Um, and we built an online classroom. Uh, we built it in Flash. That was really cool back in the day. Um, and we built a course management system. And everyone that used the product liked it a lot, but we weren't able to get the kind of traction we needed to grow. And then the massive online courses started to emerge. And I changed you know, to industries, but there was always a part of me that wanted to go back because I, I really liked this idea of leveraging um, all the cool things that happen with digital, right? Our ability to connect millions, now it's billions of people with certain social networks out there. Um, the ability to connect people can create these amazing digital co- digital economies of scale, right? And it can allow us to, to create these, these amazing div- digital leverages. That's hard to say. Digital leverages, right? Where like somebody can be in one place and they can perform a task, they can help you do something somewhere else. We've seen it used for a lot of different things, right? I can press a button and a car can come. I can write a post and everybody can read it. To me, the final frontier is I can talk to anybody anywhere and I can learn from them. 
Um, and one of the coolest things, and this is why Preply is focused on languages right now, is it's just, you know, it sounds magic. Uh, the, the way, you know, when you pressed a button, a, a car would come to say, you can learn uh, Spanish from somebody who's sitting in downtown uh, Distrito Federal, Mexico right now. Um, that's pretty cool. And, uh, and I love the idea of being able to solve these, these big problems. Like, what does it take to make learning online as good, hopefully better than learning offline? Um, and do it in some place where in the end, it's like a superpower, right? Uh, when, you, when you teach someone something, uh, you're both better for it. I used to be a teacher for a long time. I still do it occasionally. Um, I learned almost as much as my students by being forced to like think about all the stuff I had done over the course of my career. And I hope, uh, at least that's what the, 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 uh, the, the reviews say at the end, I hope that they were able to learn something as well. So for me, it's, it's, really, it's a really powerful place. Also, Preply was one of these companies, like a lot of companies. King, King had a certain uh, bump as well with the, with the recent, um, all the stuff that's happened in the world and us, and us being forced to, to communicate more online. Preply was one of the places that, that, that was able to benefit from that, right? It's a company that's been around for, for almost a decade now. So, uh, you know, there have been a lot of people that put a lot of time in to create the boat and the sail that when the breeze came of everyone being online, it took advantage of that. But one thing that happens in these in these hyper growth scenarios is it can become very easy to focus on just scaling and building more things and, and not really reflecting as much as we need to on why are people doing this and what does this mean in the world that we're in right now? And that's where the, the second part of the answer to that question, why Preply comes in. It's I saw this as a great place to go and apply this this work that I've been I've been trying to do for the last like, wow, almost 10 years now, which is, you know, take design, take research, unite them get them to ask the questions and then focus the entire org on answering, on answering those questions. I've actually affectionately redubbed the product and design, um, sorry, the product design and uh, research org product detectives, because I think it's so important that we spend our time asking and answering those questions. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and do it. A shout out to Sergi Vila who gave me this quote back in the day, but he told me, I love this. He said, all of user centered design really comes down to the karate kit. So I'll pause for effect here because there's no audience. The Karate Kid user-centered design. What does that mean? Well, you have to gather insights and apply insights. Gather insights and apply insights. And if you're doing it the wrong way, right? If you're just building things because you think you should or because the competitors are doing it, and then you're going out to find insights like, hey, what do people think about it? You're not doing it right. You got to start with gathering, uh, learn from people that are using your product or could be using it, and then, and then apply them. There's going to be a GIF on you after this. So. So. <laughs> Gather and acquire. Um, I really love all of that. I'm just thinking through. I think what you said there on um, educating and, and, and teaching people, it can be applied to almost anything that you're doing. If you if you can understand how to teach um, teach somebody who doesn't know what you're talking about and you, you think about it and how am I going to actually teach this to a, a person who doesn't understand and, and what do I need to change in my approach and then put, put it into context. I think that can uh, be applied in every, every kind of scenario, whether it be trying to get stakeholder buy-in or, or, or team engagement. Um, so it's, it's a really good point. Um, and so I'll pause for a moment to ask the audience, now is your time to ask, uh, to come in with questions. Um, I'll be listening here on chat. So please do ask them. And uh, I'll move on now to um, uh, how do you put design truly at the heart of the company? Um, you talked earlier about teams and, and that usability, desirability and, and, and alignment. How do you do that company wide? I was lucky enough uh, in 2018 to go to uh, BJ Fogg, the author of the Fogg Behavioral Method, uh, his boot camp in California, which it I won't, I won't beat the pandemic drum too much, but it just seems like a lifetime ago that you could just get on a plane and easily fly somewhere and spend three days with people talking about these topics. But it was very cool. And one of the things that he told us was when you want to change something, first start with prompts. Like, are people getting the message that they should do this new behavior? Then you can focus on ability, making it easier. And finally, you can focus on motivation. Last year, when I was at UXDX, I talked a lot about prompts and about ability. I talked about how you can make it easier for people to to get their stuff tested and learn from the insights, how you can remind them, how you can make it more exciting. I didn't really get into motivation. To me, the, this, this, um, 
your question leads me to the final stage in that, right? It's like, if you want to get an org really user-centered, you've got to start focusing on motivation at some point. There's only so much you can get from prompts, reminding people, ability, making it easier. Eventually you got to get here, right? And this is the funny thing. You said, how do you put design at the center? It's actually not design that you put at the center. It's going to sound very Zen here. I hate to, I hate to, to be like the guy who took a mindfulness course, but it's really, the center is hollow. Uh, what you're really trying to do is not put design at the center. You're trying to put the user at the center. And the thing is, design is in a special place in order to do that because design, again, when we talk about design plus research combined, we spend more of our time thinking about uh, and talking to the users directly than almost anybody else. So what we need to do is we need to take all of the emotional like salience, all of the power of the empathy that, that designers and researchers tend to have I'm not saying that people don't have it naturally inside a product or, but, you know, if you're spending all your days thinking about, you know, thinking about code or thinking about like, you know, the bottom line, it's hard to, it's hard to take a break and do that. Design, we, we we're constantly thinking, we literally look at a screen and say, how is someone going to understand this? So someone just arrived, we're going to think we are set up in order to, to actually affect that. And the cool thing is uh, when you put the user at the center, suddenly this really great thing happens. It stops being about me. It stops being about us and it starts being about them. And if you want to stop an argument very fast, or you at least want to make it more positive, make the argument about how we help that other person and not me versus you. Because when our agendas collide, that's when, you know, we see kind of the world that we have today. But when we think about someone else and how we can serve them, that's how, that's how we really get to the core of, of this deeper motivation, I would say. And I'm lucky enough right now, we talked about this a minute ago, I work in education right now, so I can say, oh, I'm helping all these people learn and all these people teach. But in the end, almost any product you work on, if it's successful, and with any company, if it's successful, it's doing something good for somebody, right? Intranets, right? Those are just giving people the information they need to do their job better. Uh, the tool that you use to, 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 to book your, your travel for work, the tool that you use to write down, uh, you know, how many hours you work this month, just making that experience a little bit better. You're gonna, you're, you might not bring a huge smile to somebody's face, but you'll, you'll definitely make it better for them. So this idea of putting the user center of getting everybody to rally around that idea and then to use that to help soften some of the bumps in the road. Cause you know, we're in a, we're in a hyper growth startup right now. It, it's tough out there. You know, we we're, we're, we're pushing really our team really hard right now. Shout out to all the preply designers. That, uh, that did take the time to, to, to join today. And those that talked to me this morning said, look, we got, we're got we shipping something on Monday. I'm not going to have time to, to, to watch your interview. Maybe I can catch it on the flip side. Um, it's tough out there. And the best thing to um, to iron out those, those bumps in the road and keep a team motivated is to make it about somebody else and remind them that like we're trying to do good in the world, even if it's one step or one product at a time. Yeah, I really like that. And your your BJ Fogg analogy um, stood out to me. He spoke at a conference I organized about a decade ago, and um, he handed out floss to the entire, there's about an audience of 2000 people. He handed out dental floss to the entire audience. And the analogy he was trying to get across was daily habits. So how do you change behavior, um, whether it be within your team or, or user behavior? And you do it bit by bit by creating those daily habits that they they become a norm. Um, is there anything you do either for your user or in, in that in that instance that kind of applies to that? Um, what we have done a lot of is is uh, is focus on so what Fog was doing with uh, with the dental floss was making it much easier to do it. Right, the idea of even has a great book out now. Shout out to, to BJ, like the, it's called Tiny Habits. Uh, it's a really great read. It summarizes a lot of his work. Um, and the idea is like, if something is hard to do, don't make it hard to do. Start really, really small. If, if you want to get in shape, do one push up a day. If you want to, if you want to have cleaner teeth, uh, floss one, one tooth, and then you can build on that success because in a lot of ways, and this is one of my favorite parts of it. Like the, the idea of making things easier and remind them is very powerful. But one of the things that I loved is he, he talked a lot at the boot camp about how uh, habits are rooted in success and in feeling good. So the thing is, when you have a very easy habit to do one push up, one tooth, it's easy to feel good. It's easy to feel like you did it because it's not hard to do. And one thing I foc about, focus on a lot in, in, uh, in Preply and I focused at King is don't look at the downside, look at the upside. So, um, and again, this is going to sound, you know, uh, it's going to sound very, very mindful, very new age, but, you know, 
if we hadn't taken this time to talk to these users, we might not have done this thing slightly better. So don't think about all the distance between where we want to get. Think about the the the, the distance from where we were. Um, it can make it very powerful, especially when you know there's a, there's a thing that happens. Let's let's talk you know straight talk here for a minute. When you talk to a lot of your users, when you have live town halls like we've organized at Preply this year, you get tough questions. Uh, you get questions about things that you don't have time to fix right now because you know you're. You're relatively short staffed and there's, you can't do everything at once. It can become very easy for the team to think, oh, I don't want to talk to the users. Like, I don't want to hear, I don't hear more people complain about stuff. Well, guess what? Mixed in with all, with, with the requests that you can't satisfy right now are a lot of wonderful stories about how you're actually doing good in the world and how things are, things are looking up and how you made somebody's life slightly better. And if you can focus on those things as well, then you can create the, the powerful loop. Going back to your first question, this is what games get done really well. There's a wonderful TED Talk. I can't remember the exact name, but it explains how, how excellent Mario Brothers is for learning and how it doesn't focus on telling you you did wrong. It just lets you keep playing until you get that first level right. Um, that's an old trick from onboarding, right? First is you, you just dive in. Uh, uh, sorry, video game onboarding. First is you just dive in, right? There's not a lot of tutorials. And if there are too many tutorials, they're not doing a good job. Um, they let you play, they let you fail, but guess what? You get another life. You get to try again. And that's how, and that's how habits are created when, when we focus on success. Last thing on this, I have a feeling if you're an ambitious person, like I try to be, uh, you may focus on, on, you know, where you failed and you may focus on, you know, it's easy to get down, right? Especially when you fail at a habit. The thing is, if you, if you focus on that failure, you create these narratives that make it really hard for you to even want to go back into that space and try, the, try it again. And when we're talking about the future of our companies and our products, we can't afford to, to let that kind of demotivation kick in. So we have to focus on the positive, even if it starts off with small doses. I talked uh, last time about how we started to do uh, user tests at King, literally one test at a time. We would bring in users. We didn't ask anybody's permission. We focused on the making it easy. We would just grab game designers. Hey, look, somebody's here this morning. Do you want to do you want to test? It would have been very easy for me to go, oh, all of the features we did not test this week. All of the things that are going out that didn't go through this process. Um, how frustrating would that be? No, let's focus. Hey, we, we got one. Great. We've lost one tooth. That's, that's, a, that's a better bedrock to build success and ha successful habits and successful products. I really love that um, focus on, because yeah, you can get bogged down with what you didn't do. Um, and it's that incremental gains. If you look at in six months time, we'll actually look at what we achieved. You can almost feel like you're going nowhere. Um, I guess what's the biggest example for you of that, that you were, you, you did something that was out of your comfort zone, that was too much um, of a risk and um, it paid off for you. Well, that's a great question. Um, I'm really tempted to say uh, the example of building the, the research, but I've already talked about that to a certain extent. So I'll talk about something a, a lot more personal, which was the first times that I started to actually work with the game teams directly um, inside King, because originally I, I was brought into King to help work on social features. I would kind of float above the game. That was a lot more my bread and butter. Um, actually going into the games was, was pretty tough. Um, was, was, was a new world for me, right? I, I mentioned all of the cool things about game design. So when I started to actually work with uh, some of the amazing game designers like Carlos uh, or Carmen that are still at King right now, um, it was it was weird for me because like this is there's a there's a nice thing <laughs> there's a nice thing to having a little bit of gray in your beard, right? You feel like you understand how to design features, but when you move to a brand new industry, it can be pretty scary. And I have to admit, it took me a little bit of time to overcome that initial hesitance. And so what I did was I'd focus on. How many pieces of good feedback did I give when we started to talk about like the actual interaction, uh, the actual game design of features, as opposed to focusing on, on, oh, you know, like I was wrong about most of these things, or I didn't focus on this. And actually that's a great tip when it comes to predicting as well, right? Like teams uh, have a tendency in the end, everything we do, even if we, if we say that we're doing experiments and we're A-B testing, there's still an implicit prediction there, which is we're going to be right most of the time, Right we're going to be wrong most of the time, or we're going to be wrong probably at least half the time. And if we focus on the fact that at the end of the rainbow, there's always a learning to that we're going to bring from the experiments that we're doing and those insights and those failures from today might be something that power us and, and inspire the next great feature. Then again, that can create the, the positive feedback uh, loop. 
I find that so much, not to belabor this point, but I, I think BJ is really right. I find that so much of what keeps us from trying new things, from creating habits, from listening to our users, talking to your users, so much of it comes down to the fear of a failure and the fear of feeling bad, right? The fear of hearing something you didn't want to hear about your product or hearing something that you're not going to be able to solve. And, and it's just a nice little hack, this thing of like, well, if I can change one out of the 10 things I hear, at least it's something. Um, and it all comes down to just overcoming that initial thing. You can do it in a lot of ways. You can make it easier, but you know, you have to also focus on success. Yeah. I love that. Uh, I have a question here from Jonathan. Uh, Great. Thanks, Jonathan. How- how do you encourage everyone in the organization to care about the user? Great question. So um, first off, you, it, well, I think there's an overarching answer to this, which is you need to connect with a natural empathy that everybody has. Um, it's one of the things they say a lot about when it comes to online interaction, right? If we were forced to talk to each other, Uh, We were forced to talk to the same people that we were interacting with on social networks. Uh, We wouldn't talk in the way that we do, right? People have this natural innate civility, right? We have this ability to kind of sync up when we see each other in person. It's one of the tough things about doing all these things over video right now. So everybody has a certain amount of natural empathy. Yeah, maybe some people score a little bit higher. Some people score a little bit lower. It's easier for some people to engage that. For other people, it's not. What you need to do is you need to find a way to activate that. And going back to my early answer, first things first, make it really easy. So we organized uh, live town halls um, at Preply. And, you know, Preply, we're, we're still a scrappy startup. We're about 300 people right now. But I deliberately didn't ask for anybody's help in organizing the first ones. I used Eventbrite for the tickets. I did ask one person from our, CR, our awesome CRM squad to send an email to, to, to learners on our platform to get them to attend. But everything else I did myself because... If I asked people for help, it would have taken it would have taken a lot more time. And then when we had the when we had people sign up, it was really easy. It's like, hey, guess what, everybody? Tonight at eight o'clock, we're going to be talking to Learners Live. It's just a click away. Making it easy to interact with your your users is really powerful. And then the other thing is, and this is really really important. And it sounds really obvious. And I'm sorry, Jonathan, that it sounds so obvious. But like again, hardest to learn was the least complicated. There's a reason why the news isn't just a bunch of graphics, right? There's a reason why we use photos for things. I don't know. I won't, I don't want to get, I don't want to get political here, but if you saw the video on YouTube recently of a certain whistleblower explaining the documents that she took from a certain very prominent social network, hearing someone say it and seeing the emotion uh, when she was talking about her experience as a whistleblower, was very different from like, you know, a tweet that you saw with like, you know, 140 characters. So you have to go for emotional salience, make your users real. It's much better to have a small number of qualitative insights from a small number of users that you can put a face to, that you can put like an actual quote to, than a, than a fabulous graph. The graphs are great when you actually have to figure out what you need to do. But if you want to like, if you want to create the drum beat, if you want to do what I say is like, um, if you want to start the fire and you need to just like be on the woods and just create some sparks, there's nothing like actual emotional salience. Again, going back to the town halls, that's why we did it because when we heard stories from people live, it's much more powerful than reading about it or, or at the worst, just seeing a graphic data scientists out there. I am not throwing any shade at what you do. We could not possibly solve these problems. I'm talking about when we get hyped up enough, when we get motivated enough to actually solve the problems, we need some human interaction there. Yeah, and I think I had an interesting uh, panel debate and prep for 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 the event um, on on the the next one um, one around UX methodologies and and work and there's a very big difference in obviously data and, and UX and the roles and they can almost sometimes be perceived as too similar when in fact they're incredibly different. Um, I have another question in here from Alan. Um, I really love this one. How, what have you taken from King Games? What's the best thing that you've taken in terms of what your team has worked and brought it over into Preply? Wow, Alan, that's a great question. Well, first off, I mean, the first thing that I did was I asked, uh, um, I, I did a series of like- Hires? Uh, huh, sorry? <laughs> you poached people? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, oh my God. I'm sure, I'm sure there's some folks from King watching this right now. I have not poached them. No, I did a series of like what I- Called, well, I mean, I think they're called 
like Ignite Talks. And so I brought in a bunch of people. And one of the people that I brought in was Carmen Hevia, our amazing uh, associate U- game UX uh, director at King, uh, to come in and, and explain to people like, actually talk about gamification, right? And, and the things that I was kind of brushing, you know, covering very briefly, she went into a, a lot of detail. So so the first thing was just getting people to come in and, and, and talk about that. The biggest thing that, that, that I saw, well, this is, this is my favorite lesson of all from King. We've been talking about it a lot. When it comes to, um, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but I'll go into a little bit more deep, detail now, Alan. Uh, when it comes to gamification, you have to start with one big idea and then you can come up with a lot of smaller things to reinforce that. So there's a reason why there's a map on Candy Crush with numbers. And there's a reason why every time that I would fly back and forth uh, in the old days when we did this, uh, I'd fly back and forth between the King Studios and I would go through customs and I would talk to the people and say, hey, where do you work? I'd say, I work at King Games. And the person would lean in and they'd say, I actually play Candy Crush a lot. I always thought that was interesting that they would lean in to say it. So that's something that Candy needs to work on is make people proud of it. But they'd always say, and I'm on level blank. That's a really powerful thing, right? Like, I'm not saying that every place has to have every game and every feature has to have this innate sense of progression. It has to be tied to a number. But if that's what the first thing that people say about their experience, it's pretty interesting. Then all of the stuff that you do after that can reinforce it. When people work on gamification, they tend to start from the opposite, right? Which probably matches with our normal way of working on features, right? We think, okay, what are 10 things I can do to improve onboarding? What are 10 things I can do to improve retention? Games don't get to do that. They have to think about big ideas. I used to, that was, I didn't mention this earlier, Catherine, but that was also a big warning for me. I used to think, oh, creative visions. That sounds like that sounds like the old days, right? Like before we had like user-centered design and everyone who wanted to do the thing they want. When I, when I joined games, people would talk about like a vision for the game and this big idea for the game. I thought that was nuts because I came from like software. They're right. You do need that. I'm not saying you have to have a big vision for it, but if you want to gamify something, you definitely have to have it. So I won't go into detail now because we haven't signed an NDA, all of us, but there's some really cool things that we're cooking up when it comes to how do you leverage that big idea and having a big idea at Preply. Thanks a lot for your question, Al. That was a great one. Uh, and, and can you, just a follow-up to that, can you over-gamify? Um, should, you, should you use it in every product development? Should you try and look at the gamification of, let's say, events? Or It's a great question. Um, I don't consider myself to be enough of an expert to have like a definitive opinion of if you can over-gamify. I think if you take if you use the um, partial definition that I've alluded to a bunch of times, you can definitely pro- do that too much. Um, there's a funny thing. Like I had never even heard these terms before I joined King, but like, you know, mid core games, casual gaming, hyper casual. Uh, it's the segments that users, uh, that players for games fit into. And, and one of the most important things to understand when it comes to and hardcore gaming, obviously, when it comes to hardcore, mid core, casual and hyper casual, it's, the amount of time that the players are willing to dedicate, but also the amount of efforts they're willing to, to, to spend in order to understand what the hell is going on in these games. Uh, my 14 year old, when he's playing Call of Duty, will spend a lot of time understanding how to play better. He's very patient when it comes to onboarding. He's very patient when it comes to understanding his performance and improving. Me, when I play Candy Crush in the morning, when I'm having my coffee, not so much. I just want to get to the good stuff. So, I think you have to be really aware of where your where your I am getting confused now because between users, learners, and players, I've had to change three times. My when your users, when you understand where your users fall and how they're using your products, that's probably a pretty good guide to how much you can gamify it and how much you can spend, how much time you can spend actually reporting back on the performance uh, to people, because that's a big part of, of gamification. It's not only achieving something, but actually allowing me to celebrate and allowing me to feel like I did this right. Yeah, love it. Um, there is another person who is inspired by your conversation so far. Alexi asks, should the designer be a T-shaped person? Um, interesting question. I would say yes, if the T, is uh, I've been watching RuPaul's Drag Race a lot. So when I hear the T, it makes me think about uh, about like a um, bunch of drag queens. Anyway, uh, so when, when you talk about the T for designers, um, 
if it comes to being able to explain the value to users, to be able to evangelize for users, to be able to contextualize the decisions you've made when it basically being strong communication, then yes. Um, I don't think anybody that's in research uh, or design has the luxury of not being able to explain their thinking and what they're doing. Um, and in fact, I would say, going back to my earlier comment about how many times we're afraid to do new things, I've worked with a lot of designers in classes and in the orgs I've worked who have, have I've needed to pull them away from their screens and say, look, your designs aren't going to speak for themselves. If they're based on specific insights, on things that you learned about the users, you're going to need to be able to explain that to people. Uh, if we're going to empathize with the people we're designing for, we're going to have to be able to do it. And the cool thing is, in all the, you know, all the classes I've given and all the designers that I've been able to work with, I've never found a designer that once they unlocked they changed that mindset and then they unlocked their superpower, which is like designers are really good at visualizing things and, and contextualizing and anchoring them. They all tend to be amazing at it. So I wouldn't say it's a T that they necessarily have to like go out and find. It's more that they have to find within themselves. Yeah, really lovely answer there. Um, and so for I'll, I'll ask this now for, for people out there that are bought into this, but might struggle with this approach um what's your advice on, on habits and, and everything that we discussed there's wow we i could give i give more advice on this topic than we could possibly cover in five minutes all right long story short uh because i know that we're, we're running out of time so first things first be very careful when announcing what you're trying to do okay and what i i don't mean that you need to be secretive but if your goal is to make people empathize with the users more don't start off by saying to people, hey, you're not empathizing with the users enough. Let me help you empathize or even telling them what your, your plan is. Uh, there's, there's a reason why there's a great book called Undercover UX. Um, when people come at you and they say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to sell you this thing now. I'm going to I'm going to convert you to my way of thinking, my my Jedi UX thing. Uh, people's barriers go up. When you just say, hey, look, I talked to this user or did you hear, did you see what the people are saying in customer support about that feature we announced? Then people tend to be much more open. So one of the things that I, I try to do, and I even did this abruptly to a certain extent, like I didn't talk a lot about what I was trying to do when I first joined and I wanted to try to bring the users more front and center. I just did it. Um, so that, that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, goes, I feel like this has become the theme, but start small, feel very comfortable starting small. Look for, look for little wins. Little wins, sorry. Um, actually, a long time ago, uh, I gave a talk at a conference and somebody asked me, like, what's the best way to start something like this at a company? And I, I had to say, you have to be like a surfer. Um, and you have to be like a surfer in the sense that you have to feel very comfortable letting certain waves go by. Not every feature, not every thing that users are complaining about is going to be the thing that you're going to be able to, like, start to create this empathy, right? Start that empathy fire. But also feel relaxed that, um, so not, not everyone, not every wave is the right one. So you can let some go by, but also there's always going to be more waves. So you can also not feel like you have to do it right now. It was one of the hardest things for me to learn at King. I, I, you know, I spent the last three years really trying to lead this player centric revolution. And, and I started off so motivated and so excited. And then we'd kind of be upset at the end of the day. I was like, wow, I haven't done very much. And only when I, when that, when that, that, that switch flipped, and I said, no, 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 not how far do I have to go, but how far have I come? That's when you start to get excited and you can really start to add. And so start small and above all, uh, don't tell people, <laughs> don't scare them away. Don't don't people don't like folks that are evangelizing, but they definitely like listening to uh, to, to good words. Yeah, I Chris, I had five questions for you based on our, our prep call and. I've had two major conversations with you and they've both been inspiring. I wish I recorded the other one and this one has been equally just amazing. You're, you're wonderful. Um, so, and I know that the audience will have got, have got a lot out of this. So thank you. Um, we'll have to ask you next about your passion another time about your, your, what, how, what drives you and motivates you to, for the, for the next stage and, and the next piece, but we'll save that for, for another day.